Good evening. I'm Rena Agarwal, Vice Provost for Faculty for Georgetown, and I'm also the Robert McDonough Professor of Finance and the Director of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. So today we are delighted to welcome and start our inaugural Leaders of Global Finance Speaker Series. This is hosted by the Center for Financial Markets and Policy and also by the Stanton Distinguished Leaders, uh, Leadership Series. Just a little bit about the center. The Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy provides thought leadership for global finance. The center offers innovative, influential, and thoughtful commentary, conducts research that impacts practice and policy, and we host dialogues and conferences involving scholars, practitioners, and policymakers. Through the center, we contribute to an informed public discussion regarding critical issues related to global financial markets. We invite you to learn more about the center on our website. So the series, the leaders of global finance, this series brings together influential thought leaders from the world of business to discuss trends in global financial markets. And for this audience, they'll also talk about the skill set needed to succeed in today's global business environment. We are delighted to have Mr. Ken Griffin as our inaugural speaker. Ken founded Citadel in 1990 and has since served as the firm's CEO. Today, Citadel is recognized as one of the most respected and successful investment firms in the world. Citadel invests across all asset classes and is one of the largest hedge funds. I, I went to their website and, uh, and their mission statement reads something like this. The firm's mission is to have a positive impact on the global economy by deploying capital to reach its fullest potential. So for this audience, I want to read out a few other comments. Citadel has been listed as one of the best places to work for young college graduates, recent college graduates. And why is it a great place to work? I picked up some comments from recent graduates who have started working at Citadel. Here's what they said. So one said, the three words that I would use to describe the firm's culture are meritocracy, innovation, and hustle. Another said, I've been challenged with a tremendous amount of responsibility since my first day at Citadel. While the learning curve is steep, just like it is at Georgetown, it has been a rewarding experience that has allowed me to make important contributions from the very beginning. Another one said, Citadel has great perks, a speaker series featuring top uh, entrepreneurs and top authors. We participate in a number of team sports, volunteering, community programs, a great tuition reimbursement program, and it goes on and on. Okay. So for uh, those of you who will be looking to uh, go out in the job market, this is one of the best places to work. Okay. I want to introduce Professors Andy S. and Doug Dillard. They're teaching the hedge fund investing class to our MBAs, and they are very successful hedge fund managers themselves. They have, uh, uh, it, it's really amazing for us to have faculty like Doug and Anne teaching our students, and then on top of that, bringing in this great group of speakers for the benefit of our students here at Georgetown. Now I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Diaz and Professor Dillard, and they are going to lead a conversation with Mr. Citadel. I could go on and on about Citadel and about Mr. Griffin, but I think this audience knows quite a bit about both uh, Citadel and Mr. Griffin, so I'll hand it over 
to Doug and Anne. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Uh, thanks, Rena and Ken, thanks a lot for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, one thing people don't know about Ken is that uh, he, he was the other half of a very successful Patonk team uh, a few years ago in South France where we dominated uh, a lot of very serious, including the world champion Patonk player. So that's a, a little known fact about, oh, about Ken. You've probably been, never been introduced like, by that, like that before. Um, so I want to thank Ken for coming. And uh, who uh, is, is teaching this class with me is going to start, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll chime in. So for those of you uh, who don't know Citadel and its investments, perhaps, Ken, you could start with explaining what Citadel invests in today. Sure. So at Citadel, we have two large areas of focus. We run a just shy of $30 billion hedge fund that invests capital across five core strategies, equities, macro, quantitative strategies, commodities, and credit. And then in Citadel Securities, we run one of the largest market-making efforts in the world. We are the largest trader of equities in the United States and in most foreign countries, and one of the largest traders in the fixed income and foreign exchange markets globally. So those are the two key areas of focus at Citadel 2017. And Ken, you're known to have started your career by taking knowledge of the computer sciences and applying them to the finance market. Um, to identify value in convertible bonds and warrants. But how did you get started trading in the strategy of statistical arbitrage? So we, we entered into the statistical arbitrage business in 1994. And it was really at the pushing of Frank Meyer, who backed me out of college. Frank was a very strong advocate of trying to expand the scale and scope of the platform. And I met a gentleman, David Michel, who ran a statistical arbitrage strategy for a competitor convinced him to join us. And here's, here's one of the great things that happened. I had a young colleague, recently had graduated from, from Berkeley with his PhD in super string theory. And my young colleague decided that uh, this idea, statistical arbitrage, as practiced by this market practitioner, was a bit dated. And so he used his background in analytics and mathematics from his years of experience in statistics to create our core stat R business back in the, in the mid-1990s. And it's, it's actually, in some sense, parallels some of the stories of Rentac. So here you have an individual who had no traditional finance experience, exposed to the concepts and ideas, but who had a much stronger toolkit of mathematics and of, of how to solve problems, who took it upon himself to, I can do this better. And that gentleman, James Jay, was, as, who's at Citadel today, has been my partner for a long time, one of the most important people in the history of the firm, like truly my partner in building Citadel, built our stat our business starting there in 1994, inspired by the gentleman that we hired with experience, one of our competitors. Speaking of maths applied to investing, we're talking a lot about algorithms running money today. Are algorithms better than flesh and bone investors? And in 10 years, will robots run all our savings? Not a chance. So the core of our business, our biggest business, is what I refer to as just good old fashioned stock picking. Single largest driver of revenues at Citadel is our team of 90 equity portfolio managers organized by industry specialty who understand the businesses that they invest in cold. Your stat R businesses are very good at picking up small, short-term inefficiencies in the marketplace, but they will never replace the judgment and decision-making of humans that are interacting with management teams, interacting with end customers, interacting with the supply chain, who are able to create a much better mosaic of what's really taking place with respect to a given business. So the stat R businesses are, are very good at addressing short-term market inefficiencies. They're incredibly powerful at that. You know, a human can't look at a screen of 3,000 stocks and go, huh, based on how IBM and Apple just moved, HP should be up two basis points. Uh, humans don't do that. But computers can do that, and they can do it very well in the short run. But on the flip side, computers will never, in my opinion, replace the judgment and intellect and the ability to connect dots that people do who are world-class analysts in equities. 
And if that's the case, what would be the role of artificial intelligence or machine learning in helping to support this human judgment that portfolio managers are applying? So those are two words that we use today as if they are the same, and they are very different. Machine learning is pattern recognition. At the core, machine learning is about pattern recognition. And where you see patterns, you see applicability for machine learning. And in financial markets, there's certainly some patterns, and we can detect those with machine learning techniques, and we can seek to profit from that pattern recognition. No ifs, no ands, no buts. But when the world changes such that patterns will be different, machine learning breaks down utterly. So if we think about Brexit, machine learning worthless from just price data in understanding what's going to happen on the Brexit vote, or the vote in France over who would lead France. And we would talk about this as sort of like the great case studies where machine learning just breaks down entirely. You could use it to sort of think about how to forecast voters, but you can't think about how financial markets will react to the vote outcome. So machine learning works really well when you have consistent, persistent patterns. It works great for Google in search. It works great for autonomous cars unless it's snowing. And then all of a sudden, the backdrop is changing. It's changing very quickly. The pattern is very fuzzy. Cars don't really know where to go. It's a bit of a problem. So machine learning has its limitations. Artificial intelligence is not just machine learning. It's not just pattern recognition. And it's well beyond the scope of computing power today. For computers to actually conceptualize problems and solve problems in a freeform way is still 10, 15, 20 years away. It's a long time out from where we are today. It's not on the horizon of forces that are impacting finance here and now. In our class today, we talked about different types of quantitative investing based on their time horizon. So high frequency, milliseconds, mid frequency, maybe days, and low frequency, months, perhaps even years. What's the capacity in each of these strategies? So the, the high frequency nomenclature is, is one of those, those words that has taken on a, a very interesting character in the days and age of the Flash Boys book, a great piece of uh, Fiction written by Michael Lewis. Really fascinating book. And, and actually, that nomenclature started at Citadel. My colleague, who has the physics background, thought about the frequency of our trading strategies. And this is a high frequency strategy, and this is a medium frequency strategy, and this is a low frequency strategy, because physicists use words like frequency. And that, that word caught on across the industry for better or for worse. In the high frequency space, for example, in U.S. equities, there's really two firms left that make any money of note. The whole story that Michael Lewis writes is already ancient history. The end users have become much more sophisticated at accessing capital markets. Goldman's algorithms are better. Credit Suisse's algorithms are better. They've gotten better at how they actually tactically execute orders. There's less money in market making as the banks have gotten better at order execution. And then your traditional competitive dynamics between a number of firms have ended up driving most of the rents out of the marketplace. And today, for all intents and purposes, we're down to two firms that make any money of note in high frequency trading in US equities. This is how competition should play out. And we've gotten to a stable equilibrium in the United States right now, which is a healthy one. Perhaps one day there'll be no money made by the high frequency shops as the Goldman's and Credit Suisse's and Morgan Stanley get even better at strategies to execute customer orders. <laughs> so the profit pool there is not, never was the billions of dollars that Michael Lewis alludes to. It's a number that's order of magnitude in the US equity market, maybe a billion, billion five. It's a big number. But keep in mind, the US equity market turns over ballpark, I don't know. Give me a second. Not so complicated. $120 billion a day. So as a percent of, of total dollars traded, irrelevant for the market making community as a whole. And Ken, going back to the, the technology issue, it's probably surprised a lot of folks to hear you say that kind of good old fashioned stock picking is your bread and butter, uh, given you know, how well known you are for technological advances and, and being ahead of the curve on, in use of technology. Do you feel like the, the, um, the, the technology advances are as helpful or more helpful in good old-fashioned stock picking as it is in uh, kind of the more 
what we think of as te technological areas like quant? So I think that the application of technology to support the decision-making processes of our portfolio managers is really helpful. Let me just put in plain English what their job looks like. They pick stocks. If we look at earnings dates as a notable date in terms of measuring their skill, their win-loss ratio, how right, percent of time they're right versus wrong, my colleagues that walk on water are 5347. If they were brain surgeons, they'd have very few patients. <laughs> All right? They go to work in a job where you are literally wrong almost exactly half the time. That's the day they live in. You live this world. Yeah, it's no. very humbling. Glad not to live it anymore. Well, <laughs> it's very professor humbling. stuff's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredibly humbling. So a key part of the analytic suite that we give our portfolio managers is around giving them transparency in their portfolio, what's taking place, what's driving changes in the portfolio valuation spot, like right here, right now. So is momentum causing their portfolio to have losses, or is there a shift towards companies with, with lower price-to-earnings ratios, or the market's discounting stocks that have um, high accruals or other signs of accounting issues. What's, what's, what dynamics are playing through the market right here, right now, in real time? And we do this to bolster the confidence of our portfolio managers who really have a tough job because you're wrong half the time. And how do you keep people engaged in a problem where they are so often, I don't want to say humiliated, but you're kind of humiliated. You get a report card every day that's an F. Now, it happens to be that 5347 still is very profitable in finance, but it's still, it's a tough report card. How many people in this class have taken home a, a, a test in the last eight years where they got 53% right, right? We hire the best and brightest. They go from having 90s as their average test score to 53. <laughs> and every tool we can to make them better, we put in front of them. We also do a lot to help them understand the quality of the research done by their analysts. So we score their analyst work product. We score the decision making of the analysts. We do a lot of work with big data to help forecast trends in consumer behavior. Lululemon sales, outperforming expectations or not. Starbucks same store sales, how does that look? So technology is intertwined in our decision making heuristics and in helping our portfolio managers both understand the world and stay confident in a world that's always awash in uncertainty. And you've talked a lot about hiring and how important it is and having a meritocracy. Obviously, you've gone from three to 2,300 employees around the world. How do you maintain that meritocracy and the culture um, that you guys have built uh, so well with that many employees in that many places? It's, it's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge. And I, actually, I copy one of the business practices from Google. So the co-CEOs of Google sign off on every single hire at Google. I literally get on every single new hire a one-page summary, key accomplishments in life, career history, and depending upon where they are in the hierarchy of employment, their executive assessment report, which is we have somebody spend four hours with the candidate and talk about their career history. So those are three of the inputs that come across my desk after they've gone through the entire interview process, the vetting process, we're going to hire this person I still retain an ultimate veto right, and I use it. If I don't think the person has the qualities that we're looking for to be the foundation of our future, I just say no. It drives my colleagues nuts. But nothing is more important than maintaining that standard of excellence in who we choose to hire. And you know, people talk about how much time we spend interviewing. I've interviewed over 10,000 people in my career. It's just what's required to succeed. So based on that, what, what advice would you give for, for folks here that are uh, interested in going into finance? Make sure you're interested in going to finance for the right reason. If you think it's a way to get rich, find another career. I've, I've seen plenty of people in my career for whom the external benefits of finance, I'm going to make a lot of money, it's going to be great, it's the calling card. Virtually none of those people ever make any money. Because you've got to compete with somebody who loves finance. Why are my equity portfolio managers so good? They, they outwork the competition. They're reading that 10K on a Saturday. They're at the conference at Monday morning. I mean, you've all seen the movie Wall Street? Maybe you haven't. <laughs>
I don't know if you should watch it or not. You know, it's this glamorous life of working on Wall Street. Yeah. There's nothing glamorous about the local residence inn in no name Arkansas where you're visiting a company to meet with management. There is nothing glamorous about that at all. It is a lot of hard work. And you're competing with, by and large, the best and brightest in America who go into finance. So if you just look at all of our top schools, the percent of students that go to the Goldmans, the Morgans, the Citadels, it's a, it's a pretty significant percentage. So if you're looking for external rewards, go somewhere else. I mean, one of my colleagues went off to start a janitorial services company. He's probably like those, that unnamed billionaire we've never heard of. Because he's competing against people who have less talent on average than you have in finance. If you love this problem set, if you're really interested in business models, what make businesses work, you enjoy the investigative aspects of trying to understand supply chain customer preferences, like how do I think about Netflix subscriber churn? I'll call 25,000 Netflix subscribers and ask every month, do you plan to renew your Netflix account? If you're willing to do things like this, finance can be a lot of fun. But if that's not interesting to you, go do something else. There's a lot of different areas in our economy that are that are incredibly fascinating to be a part of. And last question here before I open it up to the floor. What's your, your long-term, short-term goals for, for Citadel? Short-term is like December 31st is you know, <laughs> about 12 weeks away, <laughs> and we'd like to put another good euro. I mean, I do live in a world of I get a report card every single day, and my investors make capital decisions every single year. And when you have 200 investors around the world, let me tell you, I get fired every single year by somebody. All right? There's, no, there's this sort of myth that you can be self-employed. It's a myth. <laughs> um, you get fired all the time by your clients. So I need to deliver for my clients. And like corporate America that has to whine about short-term performance, I've got to deliver short-term performance. So first I is on the 1231. Let's have a good year. Let's stay focused. We've had a good year so far. Keep complacency down. Keep focus up. Keep the eye on the prize of continuing to invest our capital thoughtfully and carefully for the next 12 to 14 weeks till we get to your end. Longer run, the big focus is I'm going to win by having the best team in the world of talent. That's how we're going to win. We're going to assemble the team of the greatest talent in the world. We're going to manage that team thoughtfully. That's the one-two combination that's going to sustain our business for the next 50 years. You know, if you look at Goldman Sachs, which has had such a great run of success, they've always been on campus a firm that wins in the head-to-head -head competitions against the other banks. And when I beat them for a candidate, and I beat them quite a bit these days, I'm trying to surpass where they've been historically in the US financial system, the destination for where the best and brightest go to work. And if we manage this human capital well, we work together as a team, we stay focused on relevant problems, we keep the political dynamics down, bureaucracy out of the business, manage the complacency that goes with success, we will have a very bright future ahead of us. But as Lloyd Blankfein has put it to me, I won't know if I've been successful until the day I retire. Because whether or not my firm is there five years post my retirement is actually the ultimate mark of the success of my career. I'm not planning to go anytime soon, but those words haunt me. So I have to think long and hard about, are we creating the dynamic where that next generation of leadership talents being groomed and developed, that one day I pass the baton on to one of my younger colleagues. I've seen this do this time and time again. We've been in business for 27 years. But one day, I need to ultimately pass the baton of CEO over. And I need to make sure that we have a dynamic that creates the opportunities and experiences for people to learn how to run a global financial services firm. Great. Let's open up the floor for a couple questions before, uh, before Kennedy's run. Go ahead. We have a microphone here, too. Maybe just wait a second. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon, sir. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, my name is Rob. I'm from the Corp School of Public Policy. Um, when I look at the extraordinary low volatility we've seen in the stock market in 2017, um, one of the questions I have is, how is the volatility so low when you match that up with the political environment of uncertainty? And I was wondering what your thoughts were, specifically in the market-making section of your company, because it must be hard to uh, make those profitable edges when volatility is so low. So there's, there's two very different questions in that question. We are in a very low period of volatility. This is actually very common towards the end of the business cycle. So this is, this is not inherently unusual. 
if you're, when you're in that sort of seventh, eighth inning of the business cycle, the rate of change in the underlying economy is also lower. Right? We're seeing the challenge of low productivity, for example, right now. We're seeing businesses not change as fast as they do on the backdrop of a financial crisis. Right? So the you know, business cycle, financial crisis happens, companies shed workforce, they re-rationalize their capital investment. Winners and losers emerge pretty quickly from a strategic and financial perspective. And then as you move through the business cycle, that rate of dynamicism falls in the economy, and you see it in falling volatility. Now, the political gridlock in Washington, look, Jefferson, Hamilton, they're like toasting each other right now. They designed, they designed a political system that was designed, inherently designed, to be slow moving. We do not have the parliamentarian system of the UK where when you sweep into office, you really have the reins of political power to make fast change. The American founding fathers were very skeptical of government. They wanted a government that was very unwieldy. And, well, they got it. All right, they got it. And so, you know, I was in Washington today meeting with leadership on tax reform issues. Because we're about to make a whole series of changes to our underlying economy on the back of that. And you watch the, the wheels of Washington grind so slowly. And that's what our founding fathers wanted. Our business community actually, in some sense, is so successful because of that. We have relatively high stability on the playing field with which we can make longer term investments in the business community, right? If, if we actually thought things could radically change very quickly, it'd be much harder to create capital formation in our country if the political rules of engagement were very flexible. And take a step back. If we look at the Western world, what percentage of innovation has happened in America as compared to Europe over the last 30 years? Now, the European education system baseline is, is frankly better than America. Our colleges are still the best in the world. Our universities are still the best. But baseline education, stronger in Europe. Why is it that we beat the Europeans? It's our culture. It's our culture of, of being a country of risk takers and entrepreneurs. It's okay to fail in America. It's not okay to fail in France. And our political system, when it's all said and done, as broken as it is, is still one of the best in the world. Strong rule of law in our courts and a stability on the playing field that allows for longer term investment decisions. Profitability of a market maker these days, well, that's a, if you read the Wall Street Journal, you see all the market makers closing down. And again, it's the competitive dynamics I talked about earlier. The end users are getting more sophisticated at matching up orders without market makers in essence. And with lower volatility, there's less need for risk intermediation. and There's therefore fewer market makers. So we're seeing consolidation in the industry right here, right now. That's part of a business cycle. And that dynamicism of that, those firms shutting down, that talent gets released into the broader ecosystem, We'll hire some of those individuals. They'll bring new ideas and insights into how we run our business. They'll make Citadel more effective. And that mobility of our labor force, really important to the success of American business. Hey, Ken. My name is Sean Kamar. I'm a finance student here at the business school. Uh, I just have two quick questions. Number one, um, where do you see the future of active management with everything that's going on on the past side and, uh, you know, robo-advisors, et cetera? And, uh, and two, uh, Aptagon versus Surveyor, you know, what are the different strategies there and, you know, where do you see that going? Thank you. So there's two, two hugely different questions. I'll, I'll answer one a little bit length and one very short, all right? So let's just mental model for a moment. All the money in the U.S. equity market is passive. What happened to price discovery? What happens to price formation? Like the mental model of 100% passive just utterly breaks down. All right. So passive works so long as you have a sufficiently robust active community that drives towards price equilibrium. The vanguards of the world are enjoying the free lunch of the work of my equities team. <laughs> All right? That's what they do. And that's, that's actually totally fine. We don't need to have all the money in our economy, either active or passive, but you need some mix. 
You need some mix. And the market has solved for that. And if there were to be more money passively managed, market inefficiencies would, on the margin, increase, induce more profitability for the active managers. There'd be more of them. We'd have a new equilibrium over time. So I'm not, I'm not terribly worried about that dynamic. It gets talked about a lot, but markets find equilibrium over time. We run multiple equities team. You mentioned Surveyor, Aptagon, Global Equities at Citadel. It's about, it's about the personalities of our leaders. A given head of a business can manage 20 to 30 portfolio managers. That's their effective span of control. And there's a lot of very talented equity PMs in the world. And they self-select into our various teams based upon their rapport with other teams in the management. There's no, there's no effective difference in these businesses day to day other than who do you work for and who do you work with? Those are the big differences. Yep, right here. <clears throat> we'll do one more after this and then. Uh, Citadel's main competition for talent has to do with Apple and Google, uh, not necessarily IBs, right? So how does Citadel compete for talent with those tech companies? And my second question is, how do they keep talent motivated, like your executives motivated afterwards? So there's, there's two great questions there. There's a presupposition that our primary competitor for talent is Apple and Google, and it's not. It's not. They are a big competitor for talent, but ultimately, if somebody comes to me and says they're really interested in search, then go to Google. I mean, one, of the, one of the best women who ever worked for us, she was two years into her career for us, her, her boss comes into my office, one of my partners, and says she wants to go to medical school, and you've got to convince her to stay. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. When she walks in my office, I will offer to write the letter of recommendation. The world desperately could use another great doctor. I don't need another great options market maker but I need another great doctor. We all do, all right? So strong competition in financial services leaves fewer people in financial services. We accomplish the same work with fewer people. We free up human capital to the rest of the economy. And I don't want to try to steal the person who's extraordinarily excited about, like, the iPhone 15. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, they don't need to be my team. And, and by the way, like, I'm not being facetious. Like, my iPhone is over there charging right now. And we've all looked at the new iPhone 10 announced today, and we're excited about it. We need people to do that. So I'm looking for somebody who has the technical toolkit to solve the kinds of problems that we need to solve, who has an interest in the kinds of problems that we're trying to solve. That's who I'm looking for. And I do compete for those individuals with a large variety of industries in America. But if you don't love what we do, don't come to Citadel. Go, go, solve, go somewhere where what you do makes a big difference. I spoke earlier in the class, and this is important to think about. We're in a very different economy today than our parents grew up in or our grandparents. Who's the fifth biggest maker of personal computers in the world? No, nope, they're actually like number two or three. No one knows. No one even cares. No one cares. Fifth biggest source of online music. Who cares? We live in a world today of more and more winner-take-all. And those winner-take-all firms are so successful because of the breadth that they have today, the number of people they can touch, the number of people they can solve problems for at one point in time. I solve a problem in the capital markets. In my market-making business, I can bang that out across 40 different countries in three months or less. Right? We have a world today where we, it's winner-takes-all. I need a small number of people who are highly gifted, who are highly passionate, we're going to carry us forward in this winner-take-all world. And we can't misstep for a moment. So if you're not that passionate about what we do, I don't want you on the team. It's that simple. The second part of the question was, how do you stop executives? How do you stay? I, how do you keep them? You know what? You're 40 years old. You've got a net worth of nine figures. You can do what you want to do with your life. <laughs> and shockingly, a ton of them choose to stay with me. Some go out to be the, the, the you know, treasurer of the state of Delaware, God bless. I mean, I'm totally serious. One of my colleagues has two children with, with a drop of milk kills his kid. And he came to me and he says, look, I'm going to retire. I'm going to commit my life to trying to find a cure for my children. What do you say to that? You say, God help you. So I, I hope that my executives are wildly successful. And I hope as long as they're passionate about finance, they're on my team. And I hope when they find another calling in life, they enjoy 
all the years that they put into helping to build one of the great companies in my space, and they enjoy the fruits of that labor. One more question. Right here. Hi, Greg Tausig, Business School. Um, how do you think about how liquidity has changed kind of over since the financial crisis in terms of products that have been introduced that have mis mismatches between the underlying investments and what's being offered to investors? Um, Blackstone recently, GSO, rolled uh, some of the open-end stuff into closed-end funds and the limited number of market makers outside of your firm that are still existing in the market to the same extent that they used to be. And then if you could, um, maybe you've obviously seen a lot of firms in your career, maybe one private equity and one hedge fund firm that you admire outside of your own firm. Thanks. It's like three or four questions there. <laughs> I'm going to triage this into one answer. No. Um, look, there, there's absolutely a growing degree of mismatch between the liquidity nominally offered by a variety of products and the underlying liquidity of those markets. And that's a cause for concern. If, if I were the SEC thinking about policy issues, I would be thinking about that issue long and hard. Because you can't unwind a huge junk bond portfolio overnight. It takes weeks. It takes maybe even months. And the amount of money raised in open-end products where the underlying instruments are less liquid, I think, is cause for concern. I think that's completely legitimate. So you might want to think about how those funds deal with the proverbial run of the bank. Do they start to distribute in kind? Do they distribute in kind by date of, of seeking liquidity? How do they start to deal with that liquidity mismatch? And ultimately, our investors, how are investors going to deal with the losses that they'll incur when you get sudden market gyrations as these funds try to exit the doors simultaneously? So I think there's some legitimate concerns there in, in a public policy sense of the word. All right, that's, that's number one. Number two was... Less market makers, you know what, how, how, many, how many market makers do you need? I mean, like, how many do you need? I trade 20% of the New York Stock Exchange volume every day. Five, there you go, we need five firms, all right? <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm more or less serious, like, we don't need 50, we need five. We need five firms, five well-run firms that have the technological capability. We need more than one, because we do have technology problems, we sometimes go down, oh, those are bad days. But we need more than one, but we don't need 50, we don't need 40, we need five. And we're seeing that globally in a number of products, the drive towards five. How many major players are there in interest rate swaps today? There were 20 three years ago. We entered the market 18 months ago. We're down to seven of consequence today. We took 13 second tier players out. That's the march of progress. Right? And by the way, those five are actually doing really well. Like even though the market's more competitive than ever and bid ask spreads are higher than ever, End users are, are, are more engaged than ever about the product because the product's cheaper to trade. It's a more competitive market dynamic. Market's healthier. So good competition increases value for consumers, drives up use of the products in play, and leaves a, a good environment behind. So we don't need 20 firms. We need five global players in capital markets, risk provisioning, and risk management. Then one of the, he, he asked... Hedge fund, private equity private fund, equity. Now, that, now that Standard Pacific has gone, a hedge fund that you admire? That's a great question. Maybe Renaissance? Well, I mean, of course, I, I, I have great admiration for this. You, know, you, you always have the problem of being too close, right? Like, there are, let me just, I'll, I'll close with this. I have great admiration for Paul Tudor Jones. He's a close personal friend of mine. He was one of my inspirations. Like, when I was young in college, Paul was on top of the world, on top of his game, that was one of the firms I really admired. Ed Thorpe would be in the same category, Ram Prince Newport Partners. And in private equity, you know, you got to take your hat off to Steve Schwartzman, the team at Blackstone. You just do. Jonathan Gray runs the real estate business. He's my contemporary. Outstanding, outstanding thinker, leader. He'll run that firm almost certainly one day. So I, I give a lot of credit to Steve, not only for having built a great firm, but for having individuals within that firm that clearly have the talent to run it. In the hedge fund space, we, we don't have as many of those succession stories. That's been one of the challenges in the industry, is how do you create the succession story that Steve's created in Blackstone? You know, KKR just announced a new leadership team. I wish Henry all the success in the world. When I was in college, you know, there's no doubt that, that KKR and Henry Kravis, even private equity, was one of my inspirations. I actually 
If you asked me when I was 19 years old what would I do, I'd do private equity. Got that totally wrong, it's okay. Worked out okay for me. But Henry was my, was my ultimate hero. That's who I wanted to be when I grew up. And great admiration for both him and the team at, at, at Blackstone. Ken, thank you very much. Really, uh, really appreciate it. Um, I don't know, one more question? All right. Well, so, okay, my question for you is, you installed a satellite dish at college at 19, and then you started your fund at 22. What advice would you give to people who want to start your own fund? What advice would I give to people who start their own fund? Is that, is that the question? Well, number one is, there's a great myth about being an entrepreneur. You do not own your business, your business owns you. So just be prepared for that reality. If you don't want to sign up for that, don't start a business, but your business will own you. It's amazing how many issues you can deal with 24-7, 365. Number two is the best advice I've ever had in my life. Hire the best people you can possibly hire. I mean, if I, if I just look at, at what has been the story of Citadel over 27, 28 years, it's actually the story of how remarkable my colleagues have been on their ability to change the landscape of US financial markets. My partner who runs our securities business is roughly 34 years old. He grew up in mainland China. He grew up in Beijing. He grew up in a country where one of his neighbors traded futures contracts. It was a capital offense. His neighbor was discovered for doing this, arrested and summarily executed. He grew up in a world that you and I can't imagine. And today he runs the biggest market making business in the US equities market. He's 34 years old. So what I would say that the story of my career has been the story of the incredible accomplishments of my colleagues. The young man who went to Berkeley, who was exposed to super string theory, who saw us at our business said, I can do this better, and did. Those stories have made Citadel what it is, time and time again. So be prepared for the reality that your business will own you, and, and be absolutely willing to hire people around you who are better, stronger, smarter than you are. I will leave with this story. I was in my conference room about two weeks ago with some of my best guys. One of my guys who's most gifted at mathematics pauses for a moment to answer a question. And he looks at me and goes, it's sometimes painful to try to find the simple English to explain a concept to you, Ken. <laughs> I was like, well, OK, that put me in my place. <laughs> but that individual drives a hugely successful business for me. And it's totally OK with me if he can run circles around me with math. I have no problem with that. I need individuals like that. And by the way, when he has a hard math problem, and he's one of the best mathematicians in the world, he actually knows who to call in Switzerland to solve it. <laughs> it's like, this is really hard. I'm thinking to myself, like, that must not be solvable. Because I know who will solve this over the weekend. And the guy in Switzerland will solve it over the weekend. Like, this guy whose math skills are mind boggling is like, oh, it's months. I, Monday we have an answer. Okay, That's a team that wins. But you need to have around you that mosaic of people with complementary skills, with talents different than you, and you have to be perfectly comfortable in not being the smartest person in the room on a litany of issues day in and day out. That's how you create a great business. Thank you so much for the time to be here. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.